It's great to be back here at this conference, and I uh, just want to briefly introduce the panelists. Um, Greg Legerfo, who is Deputy Coordinator for Regional and Multinational, Multilateral Affairs at the State Department. Uh, Ajana Rajan, Assistant National Cyber Director for Technology Security at the White House, recently joined the White House. Rebecca Weiner, who's the uh, Assistant Commissioner of the Intelligence and Counterterrorism Bureau at the New York City Police Department. And uh, retired Colonel Chris Costa, who's Executive Director of the International Spy Museum and former Special Assistant of the President and Senior Director for Counterterrorism at the United States National Security Council. So welcome everyone to the panel. And um, just want to let you know, I've taken the liberty of renaming uh, this panel, Every Threat, Everywhere, All at Once. Um, and um, I think you'll see, because uh, we're going to be discussing a lot of topics, uh, we've got uh, four panelists who bring a diversity of experience, um, diversity of perspectives, uh, but are in many ways looking at the same issues, um, just in different ways. Um, so I thought that we'd start out by um, bringing us back. The last time this conference met was a year and a half ago, in the fall of 2021. And I want to ask all the panelists, um, here we are in now the middle of 2023, what do you want to tell the 2021 version of yourself back then about the future and the threats and what is really worrying you at the moment. So, let, Greg, let's start with you. Thanks, Mark. It's, it's great to be here. Um, the first thing I'd say is a year and a half ago, I was uh, in front of a crowd like this, but I was playing the bass guitar at the embassy bar in Baghdad. So, uh, <laughs> different, different, uh, different subject matter and, and different, different audience. But, um, look, I think looking ahead or looking back and then looking forward, one of the things that we've seen in, in the Bureau of Counterterrorism at the State Department is the emergence of threats in Africa. I know that's been a big theme in a lot of different panels here, uh, but the Sahel is something that's very important to us. The importance of building partnerships and the emphasis of building partnerships around the world, including in Central Asia, um, <clears throat> and also remembering that when necessary, we're gonna be taking some direct direct action, some strikes. We took, the president uh, authorized the strike against uh, uh, Zawahiri in, in uh, Afghanistan and, of course, uh, most recently uh, Sudani in, in Somalia. Uh, these, these actions will continue when we need to protect the homeland, but we're also going to concurrently focus on building partnerships, partnerships with any country that's it's willing to and interested in, in responsible and accountable governance. Uh, we'll partner with them and we'll make sure that they have the resources and the tools they need uh, to be secure. Okay, we'll get into all of this uh, deeper uh, into the panel, but I want to give everyone a chance to sort of answer the opening question. Anjana. Well, it's great to see you, Mark, and thank you to my friends at the Soufan Center for having me. Um, by way of introduction, I'm an engineer and a cryptographer. Um, started my career in Silicon Valley. Uh, the last time we were here at GSF, I was the CTO of the largest anti-human trafficking NGO in the United States. And today I work uh, at the office of the National Cyber Director in the White House. And I think the through line for all of that is that cybersecurity is not only a national security imperative, but it is an economic prosperity imperative and a human rights imperative. And I think that is increasingly clear as we think about defending our uh, critical infrastructure. I think the thing that is kind of getting me excited is just really thinking about how do we see the emerging threats around the corner. And that really takes a complex systems way of thinking. Uh, and we'll talk more about that today. Okay, so you're just uh, to follow up for a second. Um, you joined the White House just a few months ago, um, and you uh, the the White House just announced a cyber strategy. Um, what is the single biggest thing you want the audience to take away of that new strategy that you're now part of? You know, it's we're marking the one year anniversary of of Russia's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. And uh, I think three things are incredibly clear. Um, first is that the people of Ukraine are brave and resilient, and the world is watching in awe as they not only defend their country, but fight for democracy around the world. I think the second thing that's clear is that the United States stands unequivocally 
with Ukraine. The president was just in Kyiv a few weeks ago signaling that uh, the United States will stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes. And the third thing, which I think we talk a lot about in our uh, cyber strategy, is that the, the cybersecurity threat landscape is fundamentally changed. You know, the thing that I that we talk about in the introduction of the strategy um, talks about the, we're reminded that, you know, an hour before Russian troops stepped foot in Ukraine, there was a state-sponsored Russian cyber attack on an American satellite company called Viasat. And I think what, to me, this signals is that the future of global conflict is not limited to terrestrial arenas, but includes outer space, and that the weapon will include cyber warfare. And so, therefore, it is incredibly important that we talk about the cybersecurity of space systems. And this is something we'll actually be sharing with, with more fulsome uh, note, uh, news in a few weeks as the Office of the National Cyber Director, in partnership with the National Space Council, uh, move forward. Um, and I think what's exciting about space in particular is um, it's really complicated for three reasons. First, from a technical perspective, um, rocket science is really hard. <laughs> uh, and it's even harder now when you have to add the security uh, framework to, to building this, these technologies. I think the second thing is that this is an emerging and fast-growing economy filled with innovation and growth. And so how do you build regulatory guardrails that both protect this infrastructure while allowing us to innovate? And then, of course, third, from a geopolitical standpoint, um, you know, as we mentioned, we're kind of watching the war in Ukraine take place in this in this kind of new um, ecosystem. But you know, we're, it's been over 50 years since we first landed on the moon, and a lot of the world is looking kind of similar. You know, we're again, once again, in a global conflict with Russia. Once again, we need a global workforce to rise to this industrial inflection point. Um, but I think the difference with the space race too is that software is leading the way. And so cybersecurity policy will write the history books of how this plays out. Rebecca, what does 2023 Rebecca want to tell 2021 Rebecca? Lots of things. Um, but I think the key insight, which we were nearing in 2021 and becomes much more crystal clear a year and a half later, is that terrorism, particularly in the West, but I think more broadly, has become a technology problem more than an ideology problem. And that is definitely going to accelerate as information, and we're gonna spend some time talking about this um, over the panel, I know, can more and more easily be weaponized uh, and divorced in certain ways from the human error that allows us to identify it. and. I am talking about the confluence and um, intersection of the perniciousness of social media we've, we've spent some time talking about over the last two days, uh, the venality of disinformation and transformational but also highly disruptive technologies um, such as generative AI, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and we've, you know, counterterrorism practitioners have spent the last 15 years grappling with the ways in which social media has allowed individuals to radicalize and mobilize online um, mainlining ideas that are really being used to turn fear into a quest for, for vengeance and for violence. But I think operating at a more fundamental and concerning level, the information revolution has been um, at least coincided with, if not driving, widespread distrust, um, loss of faith in institutions, all sorts of institutions, all sectors, all vectors, and, and um, concern about governance structures. And while maybe that will write itself in several years, at the moment it's really disruptive. And I work for a municipal law enforcement agency, the NYPD. The reason we care and have to care about all of these trends is because they manifest themselves in real world 3D violence. And so that digital to physical realm um, is, is where I see the threat continuing to evolve. And just one last point in terms of what we're seeing in the multiplicity of threats that we're grappling with every day. Um, and again, we've spent some time over the last two days exploring these, but you've got 
active and potent networks of Al-Qaeda and ISIS in Africa, safe haven in Syria and in Afghanistan, um, an Iranian regime which is increasingly disinhibited in its desire to conduct targeted assassinations, um, the Russian war in Ukraine, um, a robust racially and ethnically motivated and anti-government extremist threat that's playing itself out in violence from Buffalo to Bratislava, um, conspiracy theory driven violence that is playing itself out in the streets of New York. We've had a couple of recent attacks in New York that um, are perpetrated by individuals who are just consuming massive amounts of conspiracies conspiracy theories and, and turning those into to violence. Um, but probably the most concerning trend, um, and this wasn't as obvious in 2021, is a real mental health crisis that is gripping our youth. Um, and that is driving everything from self-harm, suicide, to targeted violence, increasing um, extreme upticks in school threats and uh, the kind of school shootings that we saw over the last year and a half. Um, so a lot to deal with at a time when uh, I fear, and this is a, a bit of a uh, provocation, there is a sense that we're kind of mopping up the last vestiges of the jihadist threat and, and moving on. Um, so there's a lot that I would tell myself from 2021, and not that much of it is good news. Thanks, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Mark. So um, right up front, I just want to provide brief historical context because my thinking has evolved and then three quick points. From a historical context, when I rolled into the Trump administration, Inauguration Day 2017, we were focused almost singularly from a counterterrorism standpoint on the jihadi threat. We were focused on defeating ISIS, continuing the policy. Actually, there was a lot of continuation of previous policies in past administrations. Uh, we wanted to ramp up our efforts then against ISIS. We focused on Al-Qaeda, of course, and we were very much focused, as all counterterrorism folks are, on protecting the homeland and bringing home U.S. hostages. And I know there's some panels on that. Um, that will tease some of those issues out later on in the sessions. So contextually, I focused on the jihadi threat. Yesterday was a milestone. I don't know if folks caught the news, and I know Rebecca and I talked about this, but an individual was finally sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. His name was Sapoff. In October of the year that I was in the Trump administration, Halloween to be precise, uh, Sapoff was self-radicalized to jihadi, decided he was going to kill people, random people, indiscriminately. He was going to kill people on a Manhattan uh, bikeway, if you will, and that's exactly what he do, did. So uh, flash forward all these years, I'm still thinking about the threats that we had to deal with. There are victims, there are bystanders, and there was some sense of justice yesterday. I'll let the audience decide if the ultimate justice was right, life imprisonment versus a death sentence, but all that said, we can set it aside. The three points are as follows. Besides the Sapoff uh, jihadi threat, I already alluded to the fact that my thinking has evolved. Now I truly believe that we're in a fifth wave of terrorism. So that means from a career of focusing really on the jihadi terrorist threat or Islamist terrorist uh, threats, now I believe we have to be concerned globally, which means people in this audience from all different places on the planet have to be focused on anti-government terrorism because of disinformation and a dissatisfaction with the status quo. In other words, governments are unable to satiate their populations for a variety of reasons. And I think that the next 20 years or so, because that's how these generations have worked, 
we're going to be focused on anti-government terrorism. That doesn't mean that we're not going to focus on jihadi terrorism, quite the contrary. That's still going to be an undercurrent, if you will. And then the last point, something that is of great interest to me, is this idea of gray zones. And we've been talking about it. It's been threaded throughout the conference, which is why this is such an important forum, and that is talking about the ideas of great power competition. And for me, it's these gray zones, the places short uh, between war and peace that uh, our adversaries operate vis-a-vis -vis the Russians, the Chinese, people that are competing against the United States and other powers in that space. So these are the concerns that I'm worried about. Chris, thanks for that overview. Um, and on the, I mean, all four of you were, um, uh, there were some similarities in the themes you were discussing, and I wanted to go actually back to Rebecca because, because you know, Chris just outlined what he calls this next wave of terrorism and anti, uh, you know, anti-government terrorism, uh, and and that is a, what we're going to be fighting for years to come. You expressed something similar at the, you know, the granular level that you're at in New York City, right, where you said that. It's less, it's sort of the technology drives the ideology, it's less the ideology up top that is driving violence. So how do you see that at your level? Um, and, and sort of is there a, is it been something that you've seen, you know, spike, you know, in the last year or so, last couple of years, or just very gradually over time? So, and it, it's, a, it's a great question because they intersect again. Um, in a way that creates some unpredictable outcomes, the technology and the, and the ideology. So if you look at a case like Peyton Gendron, who um, carried out a horrible attack last May in Buffalo at the top supermarket, um, he is somebody who consumed a tremendous amount of ideology. In this case, it was racially and ethnically motivated extremist content um, online and displayed a lot of the hallmarks of what we call an accelerationist threat. He had a manifesto that he actually cribbed from another attacker, Brenton Tarrant. He had a weapon that he um, tricked out with all of these uh, odes to other white supremacists who'd come before him. He did meticulous planning online. So he was, he was kind of taking the playbook for an accelerationist neo-Nazi style attack. On the other hand, and I mentioned Frank James, uh, the perpetrator of a subway shooting in New York also in the spring, is another example of the very contemporary threat that we're experiencing, um, which is somebody who had been listening to and creating his own content online um, in the more conspiracy-driven world. And a third point I'll put in our little triangle um, would be the case of an individual named Ethan Melzer who was just sentenced to 45 years, which is in the U.S. system a, a pretty um, heavy sentence for giving up information on troop movements, um, an army soldier, uh, to a neo-pagan Satanist accelerationist group called the Order of Nine Angles who also was inspired by ISIS. So you see individual people doing a everything all at once kind of what we often refer to as salad bar, taking bits of ideas from multiple sources online uh, and turning them into um, a, a kind of witch's brew of, of violence. So the ideology certainly plays a role in certain people, but it is more and more muddy and murky. And I think particularly important you see terroristic tactics being used by people who display very little cognizable ideology at all. And I'm thinking in this case about uh, an attack in Highland Park on July 4th, going back a couple years to the Las Vegas mass shooting at the Mandalay Bay, um, and others in that realm, a VBIED attack in Nashville on Christmas Day in 2020. And those are really confounding to law enforcement and certainly to the intel world because these are individuals, most of our tripwires are centered around some kind of connection to a group or consumption of ideology. So when you see the tactics that are a little bit divorced from 
um, an ideological purity, it becomes harder for us to operationalize against them. And people might argue, well, that's not terrorism at all. Um, but it's not just conventional crime. And I think, again, at the local level, we have to be equipped to mitigate those threats. And that is what today's threat environment does look like. Raises the question of, of course, like the labels we put on things like what is terrorism and what is not, and really does it make a difference, and who right. cares when there is violence? Yes. And and uh, so, so Greg, the, what Rebecca just painted was the picture of, um, of you know, the, the biggest, most important city in the, in the United States, right? And um, and 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 what what this uh, threat picture looks like when it converges in violence there. Now, do you see this um, similar? What she sketched out. Do you see at the at the level where you're at, where you are, sort of administering U.S. policy around the world, uh, dealing with counterterrorism at on a more kind of macro level, um, or is the picture different? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I I think. Uh, first of all, our, our broader policy with respect to counterterrorism is, is, is first and foremost protection of the, of the U.S. homeland. Uh, and then, of course, we're building out these partnerships around the world bilaterally and in groups, and I'll, I'll mention a few of those groups in a second, uh, to help us uh, empower and enable responsible governments to, to deal with their own problems. But, but the ideology question, I think we have to be flexible on it for the reasons that Chris says. Uh, it's going to change. As long as there's people who are upset and they find any ideology and then they, they have uh, intention to commit uh, terrorist acts, and it could be physical terrorist attacks like we are used to over the last 20 years. Um, I've been at three embassies where we've, we've suffered casualties in, in the last 20 years, so that kind of terrorism or cyber. And, and so we've got to uh, look at the range of, of actions that we could, that, that we could face, um, I, I think, that, that's the most important thing is, is to make sure that we're flexible uh, going forward in our, in our approaches with which each of these countries. And uh, for example, um, we had a couple really good regional groupings in the past few months that I, I joined. One was the Negev Forum in, in Abu Dhabi. That's, of course, ex expanding on the historic Abraham Accords. And, and there's a security working group that Derek Chalet led there. Uh, you know, the, the security context there of those partners is different than the Quad, and, and we have a Quad security dialogue, which I went to in Sydney with India and Japan and Australia. They have different security uh, uh, challenges, and, and, and so the ideologies of the people that they're facing in those countries are going to be markedly different, even within the group. And so what you want to do is make sure that there's information sharing and some resilience and, and, and that you have, the, make sure people understand that the United States is a, a reliable partner on counterterrorism. We're gonna be there for the long run, whether the ideologies change. If security is the issue, we're gonna support responsible governments. So some of what you're, uh, you know, the places where you've been and you were just talking about are encountering some of the, what Chris called the gray zone conflicts, the proxy conflicts between bigger powers, for instance, Russia. You see uh, Russia's activities, the relations with the Wagner Group in Africa. How much is that something that you in your bureau have to deal with? And, and, and what have you seen um, in terms of the dynamics that it creates in the countries you're trying to build partnerships with? Yeah, great question. We went in October, pretty big delegation, Mauritania, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger. And Wagner, of course, is on the ground in Mali. And the, the reason we went there to these, these countries is because there's a, al, there's a, a JNM, Al Qaeda, ISIS threats in the region. Uh, and we want to express our support to the governments. But of course, with Wagner on the ground, which is an extremely corrosive and destabilizing force, it, it creates another, another um, uh, angle to all of this. And in addition, to get into sort of the information or the misinformation space, the, the, support, or the, the support for Russia in some of these countries is, is a little out of proportion to what I think it's, it should be. And there's a belief that uh, Wagner can fulfill security needs that they're never going to be able to fulfill. And, and that's adding a layer of complexity to the already challenging problem of, of, the, of the jihadist groups who are present. And, and of course, we want to make sure that we are 
putting incentives and, and enabling governments to make the right decision with respect to Wagner, but they've got to know they can rely on us and our partners uh, so that they can maintain their security. The presence that they see as being uh, beneficial to them by Wagner Group, like you, you see that you see that as a, a direct competition to the message you're giving about what the United States can provide. Yeah, well, it's it's not true, uh, <laughs> and so the best way to deal with with misinformation is is to give the give the truth, and and we are partnering uh, with. Uh, uh, countries in, in the region. I'm going next week to coastal West Africa, leading a delegation there. We're going to be in Benin and Togo and uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Those countries are obviously looking north and are concerned about all of this, and we're going to expand our partnerships with them. They, We, we have good relationships with, with these countries and, and, of course, countries in that area in general. But the main thing here is, under, is for our partners to understand that, that we're going to be there we're reliable. We're not just there because of a particular threat. We actually are supporting the security needs of our partners, and we're going to do that uh, over the long run. Anjana, and I also want to encourage all the panelists um, to jump in on any other uh, any response that someone else gives. If you want to amplify it or disagree or n not shout, but 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 uh, but uh, take issue, let's say. Um, but Anjana, so you're you're you. Uh, come to the White House with a tech background, and you are seeing threats, uh, the cyber threats, the, the tech sort of the revolutions in tech right now. Uh, what do you see is uh, sort of complicating the threat picture from your point of view, specifically on the tech? Yeah. Um, you know, I think when we talk about emerging technologies' role in disrupting the global order, the technology that I spend a lot of time thinking about as of late is generative AI. And just to give some context on what that means, generative AI is you know, deep learning models that can allow us to create text and audio and, and images that have fidelity that match the, human, the way humans think and speak. And you know, there's a lot of excitement in Silicon Valley about the potential of this innovation, but we have to be equally concerned about the abuse and misuse of this, these technologies. Um, I want to just foot stomp what my panelists have talked about, and I think two themes arise here. Number one is that the disinformation extremism nexus is real, and that online influence operations can destabilize democracies and incite political violence around the world. The second theme that I'm hearing from my panelists is that the war that we're seeing in Ukraine is not just a war between Russia and Ukraine, but as Greg mentioned, it is now a kind of bigger battle between accountable governments and authoritarian governments that affects everybody and every country that's represented in this room here today. And so when we think about, and if you take a look at influence operations in particular, and we look at, as you mentioned, even just Russia in particular, you know, the, the, the way this was working in the, in the decade of the past was it was not a scalable operation. It was very manual. Um, it was a very time intensive, resource intensive, expensive operation. Um, and but now when you think about the role of generative AI, that now makes the cost of a disinformation campaign in incredibly, decrease incredibly, and the efficacy and the speed increase significantly. Um, you know, you mentioned the Wagner Group in Russia, and you talked a bit about, you know, the, the significance of, the, of Africa in, in this conversation. You know, influencing one country is hard enough. Influencing 54 different countries in a continent is even harder, and now when you have generative AI, that becomes doable, because you can now upload context and data that can be multilingual and multicultural that can give you this weaponry at an unprecedented scale. And so this, these are the things that I, I get quite worried about when you think about the nexus of counterterrorism and cybersecurity and, and this broader global conflict, because now we're seeing kind of a new weapon being introduced in the information arsenal. So, so is, do you see Russia actually using generative AI to perform this function, right? So to, to spread propaganda, How, what's different about specifically Russia, what they're doing using this technology that they weren't before? You know, I can't, I can't comment on, on specific threats, but I will kind of illustrate kind of the future trends that we're seeing. Um, and I think the, the first question for us as we look at this in our position at, at the White House is starting with a very technocratic viewpoint, which is how do these technologies work? And the way we think about this framework is starting with AI, it says AI is comprised of three components. It is the data, which is what powers the model. It's the compute, 
which is what, sorry, AI, which, the data, which is what is, are the inputs into the model, compute, which is what powers a model, and algorithms, which are the intellectual property of the model. And when you look at it from that framework, then you can start to map the, the future threat landscape and see how many adversaries, including Russia, including China, Iran, North Korea, are using, are working very hard to win the AI war. And so let me elaborate a bit of what I mean by that. You know, if we're saying that data is the input into the model, then securing our data has to be the first priority for our, our counter strategy. You know, we look at China, for example, and we look at how they're working very hard to gather as much data about US citizens as quickly as possible. We have had many conversations in, in the last few months and weeks about the role of TikTok. We're seeing that consumers around the world are, are, are sharing their biometric and psychometric data in mass with, with China that is now, in, will absolutely be used to power uh, generative AI models. We're also seeing uh, attempts to, to capture uh, genomic data of American citizens by Chinese investment into biotech companies. And so from a policy perspective, what is the solution here? We need to make sure that we're closing the legal loopholes that allow foreign adversaries to purchase uh, mass data of US citizens and US persons in bulk. But we also need to invest in the use and the commercial use of privacy enhancing technologies that allow us to do complex analysis on encrypted data rather than uh, exposed data. When we now move towards the second part of the framework around compute, to me, this is all about chips. It is all about quantum. When you think about what makes AI very hard, it's that it just requires a ton of computing power. And so whoever has the most powerful microchips and whoever has the most powerful quantum computers will win the AI war. You know, I think uh, one of the comments I heard earlier this week was that Xi Jinping is watching the US's role in Ukraine. Why is that important in this context? It's because if China decides to invade Taiwan, they now have access to the single largest manufacturer of semiconductors and microchips in the world. So we have to be really focused on ensuring that we continue to support the Ukraine in this war, but that we are doubling down on investing in scientific research and development in the United States. And the president has done that on both fronts. We just signed in, in the summer the Chips and Science Act, which not only focuses on strengthening the domestic uh, supply chain for microchips and semiconductors, but also invest, invest half a billion dollars in quantum computing research and development. So that is, a, again, the trend that's getting us into the, showing the nexus of cybersecurity and, and counterterrorism. And then the final piece is around algorithms, which really talks about the intellectual property of these models. And what we're, when we talk about IP, what we're actually talking about is talent. You know, pluralism is one of America's greatest uh, competitive advantages, and this is a chance for us to really think about we need to lean into the, the best cyber talent and the best technical talent around the world to make sure that we are essentially winning the brain drain and bringing the best folks to the United States who can really make sure that we're winning in this talent. And so when you think about the framework of how we talk about emerging technology, this now gives us a clear path forward on how do we really think about practical solutions that I think many folks can get behind. Can I just push you on a specific example when we're talking about, you know, this power of AI uh, and 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 what countries could do or use, use it for? So, so this sp one uh, one subject that I spent a lot of time reporting on was Russia's influence operations in 2016, right? The 2016 election, which was, you know, the influence operation sabotage, whatever you want to call it, was multifaceted. There were um, bot farms, uh, there was you know, hacking and dumping of emails, there was outreach to various um, uh, advisors to uh, the, uh, the dead candidate Trump's campaign. But specifically, let's say on the technology part and like the bot farms, how would it be different the next time around with this technology? It's, you know, you, it was, you know, as you said, labor intensive, right? Hundreds or thousands of uh, people up at all, all times making, you know, tweeting or putting Facebook posts with sometimes very bad English, um, you know, sometimes not very believable, although it had its influence. How would it be different next time? Yeah, I think it's a great question. You know, I think, imagine instead of um, a generic Facebook post that has misspellings and 100 hashtags, you're now having someone that's having a personalized conversation with you that matches the tone of a very influential person in your life based on the data that you have exposed to them, whether that be a family member or someone that you trust. You know, we're, we're watching in real time, you know, the consumer applications like ChatGPT become part of the, the, the main discourse here in the United States. And we've seen, you know, what happens when very confidently and very assertively 
uh, inf false information is, is promoted by these technologies and the ability to discern between fact and fiction becomes even harder mm -hmm. than if you are searching in a traditional manner. You know, I think there's an, an economic conversation here on the global scale. We, we've seen in the past um, just, you know, that there are economies in, in other countries that are being paid to push propaganda on behalf of these large, you know, global players. You know, the competition for those services now becomes uh, more accessible, that the ability to compete in that marketplace becomes more uh, accessible if you are a smaller operation. Your, your precision and your efficacy becomes easier to demonstrate. And so I think we're now gonna see a new uh, economic marketplace for disinformation that will now include an, a much bigger marketplace than we've seen in the past, and that's equally concerning. What are some of the countries that are getting paid to push the propaganda? You know, I'll, I'll let some experts talk about this. In, Greg, in this you were case. nodding, so can you say? Can you say? I was not nodding as if I knew which countries, but I, I think, um, look, it's a, it's, it, I was nodding because it's a, it's a major challenge for democracies and, and open societies, if you will, to, to, to combat the, the false narratives. And, and um, you know, we, on the one hand, we, we developed a lot of these tools, um, but of course we have civil liberties and, and we're, we're trying to encourage our partners around the world to maintain those civil liberties, but then our adversaries are, are weaponizing these things and it's, it's, it's much more challenging. I'm sure Chris, you know, over the years in, in, in confronting our adversaries, uh, this has been a major, major challenge in the, in the intelligence community and, and other, other fields where we've had to fight these battles. Can I just add, it's the issue, and I don't know, I'm hoping that there are a lot of robust conversations that are going on at the federal level in our country with Silicon Valley and some of the key drivers of this new technology, but as it becomes more democratized around the world, it's not just going to be countries, right, that are going to be doing this. It's going to be non-state actors and commercial, I mean, just as it has been in the disinformation ecosystem in the past. So some of it is certainly country-driven and some of it is not. And so all of the guardrails that we have constructed um, at the country level to try to deal with AI in an ethical manner. Um, we need to reconsider and create new partnerships and this is one of the themes that has come up over and over over the last couple of days. But c partnerships between um, country level practitioners and the companies that are going to be the holders of this technology um, who have very different imperatives that are driving them commercial imperatives. Let me, let me sort of make a, ask a provocative question um, that you all may or, agree or disagree with, but um, I'd like, you know, maybe to address. Some of the, you know, in, in contrast to what we, uh, you know, have been dealing with for a couple of decades, which was, um, radical Islamic ideology uh, and terrorism that was born from that. Um, a lot of what we're describing on this panel, actually, some of the threats are coming from the United States. The technology in the, from the United States is driving some of the problems around the world uh, that we're seeing with violent extremism, uh, anti-government extremism. Um, you know, for the years after 9-11, the U.S. government would constantly go to the Middle East and go to Saudi Arabia to lecture the Saudis about the ideology that was driving groups like Al-Qaeda. Is the United States the new Saudi Arabia in this uh, threat environment? So I'll jump in there and say no. Uh, and I'll follow up with the threat dynamic that you're describing is accurate in terms of the multi-dimensional threats that we're dealing with, right? What you're referencing is this idea that the United States now is a source of the problem because we have the technologies and adversaries uh, have the opportunity to steal those technologies and then proliferate them. We've had our problems with anti-government, um, arguably political violence, that's a divisive topic. All of that said, a couple other things to think about. That first of all, we evolved through the Cold War knowing that our adversaries were very good at disinformation. But this is not the Cold War. The FBI, in fact, and I'm not a spokesman for the FBI, but certainly I've listened closely to what the director has said. I've listened at this conference and engagement with 
pro the private sector is now a significant imperative of the FBI to counter intelligence threats to ensure that the private sector understands that they have to protect uh, not just their their equities uh, from a loss standpoint, but also prevent those technologies to be stolen and used overseas. So we're in a counterintelligence dimension in ways that we never have been in before. So also your, your question goes back to 9-11, the evolution of this enterprise that focused almost singularly on counterterrorism and did it well made some mistakes along the way, but at the end of the day, because of our foreign partnerships, we were able to build a counter-terrorism enterprise. We need to replicate some of those lessons learned and apply it to this new dynamic, which means, again, unprecedented engagement with national security professionals and the private sector. And I really stress unprecedented engagement in ways the FBI never did before and they are doing now. I'm confident that the United States is doing that at home to detect, to deter hostile intelligence services. It's overseas that I worry about uh, and we have to enable and work closely with foreign partners to ensure that we have the, not only an economy of force, but we have an understanding that it's in all of our best interests to protect, you know, democratic institutions and countries from their vulnerabilities. Uh, back to your first point, Chris, about the, this, this wave that we're seeing. Was the U.S. government too focused on radical uh, Islamic ideology, radical Islamic terrorism, to, and, and, and spent billions and billions of dollars and years to fight it, uh, and therefore may have missed this wave that, or come too late to understand the way that you're now describing. So I'm not an academician, but academicians and terrorist experts will say that, they'll say far right versus anti-government, but the bottom line is th those threats have always existed alongside with whatever wave we've had to some degree. So while we were focused on the current wave, it has been called, you know, religious terrorism, uh, religious inspired terrorism. At the same time, there's been far right terrorism all along the way. Timothy McVeigh happened knee deep in, in, in Al Qaeda's development uh, as they were setting up sanctuaries. So th they live alongside, um, you know, jihadist terrorism. So we didn't miss anything. I'm just suggesting, well, we may have missed some things along the way, but not in a profound way. At the end of the day, this is just a way so that we can focus our resources on more than one thing. So we have to be on guard with this anti-government bent, this, this trend in the future and presently. But it's just coming into play. And I'll, I'll, I'll close with the final, this discussion with the final comment that Germany is the perfect example. So step away from the United States model and look at what just happened in December. Germans uh, suffered the possibility of a advanced planning for a, a far right coup and uh, penetration of the government by individuals that wanted to bring down you know, the, the German parliament to include assassinations. And that's Germany in 2022, now 2023. Does anyone want to, oh, want to address my question of the United States as Saudi Arabia? Or, uh, or, you, or are you all conveniently ignoring that? <clears throat> I, I concur with Chris that the United States is not Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Me too. To Chris's point about, you know, we need a new focus here. And, um, and to my question about what has been the focus uh, for 20 years, the, you know, we built, the United States government built up infrastructures uh, to deal with a certain type of threat. Um, I, I've written a lot about how, um, you know, the you know, intelligence services were transformed by years of fighting uh, you know, terrorist organizations, specifically like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, um, drew them away from a more traditional mission, which was, you know, counterintelligence, espionage, et cetera. 
Um, what you're talking about, Chris, is a uh, is a, 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 a next generational type issue that needs to be addressed. And all of you are talking about it in different ways. This is, of course, you are all pr practitioners at different levels. Like this takes money, this takes focus, this takes another huge bureaucratic shift. Is that in the cards and how slowly is that gonna move? Any of you can enter that. Yeah, let me, I'll jump on it uh, first. Um, you're right, if you think about, it's been, 22 years since September 11th, and, and those of us, I mean, I joined, I was in Jordan for September 11th as junior officer. There's a whole generation of American diplomats, American soldiers who, who've, this has defined their careers. And, and um, on the one hand, you know, we need to, I think, transition to address new threats. On, on, on the other hand, I, I, I don't want a situation where we we just kind of abdicate and, and move away from the things that we've we've learned and just, just just, uh, the gov well, what I, what I mean to say is our government can focus on more than one thing at a time, and we have to. And I also think that the, some of the things that we've built, we've built an 80-plus uh, coalition to, to defeat ISIS. We've shown we can do that uh, very effectively. And I think some of these things are, are re replicable or adjustable to deal with new threats or threats that, that kind of morph into uh, the space that we're, we've been effective, effective defending, I think, over, over the last 20 years. Others? Uh, just to follow up, just to, this might seem a little too tactical, operational, but just to give you an example, uh, example of the kind of adaptations, kind of a, adaptations that should take place, the Brits, the British government, the Special Air Service, the Special Operations component of the forces, or one component, the Army's component, has joined forces with the Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. This is all in the public domain to focus on countering malign intelligence behavior globally, not counter-terrorist work, but, or terrorism work, but focused on countering malign intelligence behavior. That's what we're talking about. And that might seem simple enough, but it's not. It's a paradigm shift, and it's an internal cultural shift. And that's just one example. The United States and foreign partners have to replicate those kinds of adjustments to their organizational design. And that's just one example in this new paradigm that we're dealing with. Yeah, at the, so at the, at the ground level, I think um, one of the things that we've learned over the last two decades is how fungible these tools really are, um, which is a positive lesson. And so the apparatus that we put into place post 9-11 um, is itself ideologically agnostic and it can be fine-tuned in different ways to deal with a multiplicity of threats that we now have coming at us, and that's really important. I think that if we're going to be confronting the threats of 2020, um, we need to start thinking about building those toolkits now. Um, but we have learned already a lot of the lessons that we need to know in order to deal with a very different kind of threat landscape going forward. So the idea that we've been kind of mired in a unidimensional approach to countering terrorism from the jihadist perspective and have missed other threats coming at us from other directions, um, thankfully, I think, is a bit of a misnomer. And um, we just need to, to figure out which dials to turn up a little bit and which to turn down. You know, you asked about, you know, paradigm shifts, and I'll uh, use this to plug our, our new national cybersecurity strategy, which proposes two pretty significant strategic shifts in the way we think about cybersecurity. The first is that we need to move away from, we need to start reshifting the, 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 the balance of who holds the responsibility for cybersecurity. You know, too often we rely on the individual consumer, the small business, the independent developer, or the, you know, the, the lo state or local government to respond to cyber attacks from, from nation states. And that cannot be how we uh, operate because that is a losing strategy. And instead we need to ask the, the, those who can bear the burden, both in the public and private sector, to do their fair share of cybersecurity so that the broader, uh, the broader nation can win. The second shift is really, again, looking at this not just from a national security perspective, but also from an economic perspective, and recognize that we need to leverage market incentives to, 
to push players to invest in long-term cybersecurity uh, investments, not just short-term solves. And I think this is where interesting conversations come up of what, what those solutions can be, uh, including things like what does cybersecurity insurance markets look like in the future? You know, how do we make sure that while we're creating paths for reliability, there's also paths for a safe haven? And these are you know, ideas that are very early on the policy readiness scale, but things that we want to put forward in writing in the national strategy to start building for the decade ahead of us. And so those are kind of, you asked from an, uh, uh, a rhetoric perspective, these are things that we've put forward in the strategy. Can I remember to turn that on? Um, we, we, have, we, have, we have a few minutes left, and I wanted to um, ask Greg about uh, the, uh, the administration's counterterrorism strategy, which is my understanding is classified, yet according to my colleague Charlie Savage, uh, it is, represents a sort of shift in approach to dealing with some of these issues. So, you know, it's well known that in the years after 9-11, the you know, counterterrorism apparatus adopted a very um, jargony term, kinetic approach to dealing with terrorist networks, uh, drone strikes, commando raids, uh, you know, very, you know, militaristic paramilitary approach. Uh, and, um, and then at the end of the Obama administration, there was some tightening up of the, of the rules uh, around which those strikes could be uh, uh, undertaken. Uh, in terms of basically the intelligence picture. Those were loosened, those rules were then loosened during the Trump administration, and then once again they were tightened, um, and there's been a de-emphasis on kinetic activity uh, towards other aspects of a counterterrorism strategy. To the extent you can talk about it, uh, sort of lay that out for us. Sure, thanks. So first of all, um, we're spanning two decades. Uh, I go back to September 11th and the the years after, immediately after September 11th, there, there were no drones uh, and, and, and so forth. And, and, and then fast forward, you know, just a year ago, I was in Embassy Baghdad as a charge. We're, we're shooting down rockets and drones. Um, and so think that, first of all, the tech, my point is the technology changes. Uh, and then we respond to that. We also have, have Im improved our own ability uh, to be precise. And, and I think you know, there have been some very, some, ch some adjustments along the way with our uh, uh, policies, but the bottom line is, uh, with respect to uh, when we take uh, uh, strikes, we, we uh, do it in the national interest and, and we do it to m minimize civilian casualties. We always have and, and we, always, we always will at a very high standard. Um, the, the shift in emphasis now, which, which I think is, is driven by a variety of things. One, we've, we've been effective at, at um, taking people off the battlefield, and I think now we want to, and that has enabled us to work with our partners in ways to empower them. And I think the emphasis can be on, on building the capacity of our partners, and that's something we want to do uh, across the world. We, we had the Africa Leader Summit in December, and, and broadly we talked with the theme of that leader of that summit was um, empowering our, our partners to to have uh, responsible and accountable governance. There's a security component of that which we support. That theme is is um, uh, very deeply rooted in everything we do, but in particular uh, with the with the security policy. And I, so I think that the variables are technology, the threats that we face, and and when what we actually need to counter in the moment, and then. Uh, what what tools we have going forward, and I think all those things have, have changed significantly over the last 20 years, and that's why you've seen the, the changes. And I think the bottom line is we've been we've learned some things along the way, but we've been effective. I've just been given a two-minute warning, so I want to sort of ask a final question and let anyone jump in, uh, which is because you're all, all again practitioners at a different le at different levels. Kind of the elephant in the room, of course, is the idea that. Um, you know, the American politics right now is very toxic, right? There's no one doubts that the, the language has changed. That's driven by a lot of factors, including the media. And that is now seen by countries around the world as, you know, some see the American system breaking down in certain ways. Um, they see January 6th and the January 6th attacks. And so some of the, what we're talking about here, driving um, anti-government extremism, People are just looking at what happens at the United States, and I'm wondering how you, anyone can jump in, see that, uh, you know, coming back 
home to roost. You know, I, I think we've talked a bit about kind of the nexus between cybersecurity and, and uh, counterterrorism, and, and really that they're kind of one is upstream to the other. And you know, cybersecurity fundamentally is a is a nonpartisan or prepartisan issue, and it, we need to protect that um, that mission, and so that we we focus on solutions. Um, I think at the end of the day, we have to start moving and shifting and recognizing that cybersecurity is fundamentally an interdisciplinary issue. It is not just a thing that affects a siloed sector. It is a thing that every single, in every single part of, of society has to think about. Um, and I think the sooner we can recognize that we are uh, all kind of part of this broader ecosystem and have to think about this in an interdisciplinary way, the faster we can get to defending our national security interests. Anyone else jump in? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting thinking back about the last couple of years in the U.S. and we in New York um, have existed in this little microcosm of all of these larger trends that are at play across the country. And I found myself thinking, oh my gosh, all of this stuff is happening in civil unrest and pandemic and um, all of these forces that felt very destabilizing. And then I look around the world and see a million other examples of the same kind of structural um, recalibration that's happening. So we tend to think of ourselves as uh, an exemplar or somehow unique. Um, I don't think so. I think in this, in this context, unfortunately, some of those forces and the toxicity of our politics um, are very widely replicated around the world. So I think collectively, uh, we have some work together to, to do together as a whole uh, to smooth things out. But Chris, you want one of the last word? Yeah, thanks. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. So I want to end on a really optimistic note in terms of the United States. And coming full circle, yesterday there was the hearing, Sapoff's going to prison for life. Justice was served. We're a nation of laws. Notwithstanding mistakes made along the way, it was iterative for years. At the end of the day, that individual was shot by a police officer, an NYPD officer. He was treated in a hospital. He went to trial. He faced a jury, and now he's going to jail. We're a nation of laws. We have to stick to our values, and I think there are some salutary lessons uh, with SAPOF and the journey that we've made in the last few years on counterterrorism and future threats. Greg, yeah, just, just to build on what Chris said, uh, we have a great, I, I humbly say this, but I think the United States has a very good, reliable security model, and I think that we want to be able to work with our partners, and I think it gives us a comparative advantage in the world. I think there's a lot of countries who, who will benefit from it. It also is a, is a model that preserves civil liberties and, and ensures longer-term stability. And I, and I hope that as we go through these changes with cyber, cyber threats and, and all the new changes that are going to come our way in terms of technology, that, we will, uh, that our partners will understand that the security package, that the partnership that we bring to our, to our relationships is something that's, that's reliable, it's for the long term, and it's adaptable to these threats. I want to thank all the panelists and to the audience for a good discussion. Thank you.